Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to the Sony Alpha Universe podcast. My name is Timothy Fair Matthews. I'm a DP, production house co-owner, and also a Sony Media ambassador. And I'm here in Namibia in Windhoek with Adam. Hey Tim, how's it going? Hi everyone. My name is Adam. I live in Windhoek. I've been shooting for 10 years, living here for 24, and running my own production house here for three and a half. So today's podcast, guys, we are going to be talking a little bit about the business pains and our journey and just basically give you some value in order to grow as a filmmaker. I think there's a lot of amazing material out there on the Internet and there's a lot of you know great courses, there's universities all teaching us how to film, but not many people blend it with business. Mm. And I think, you know, one of the things that Sony's doing right now, and I'm particularly quite passionate about, because I also mentor filmmakers, is that I like to talk about the business as much as possible. I like to talk about the bad bits, the good bits, Mm. and just sharing effectively, you know, all the ins and outs of running a production company. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm just gonna share a little bit about me, and then we'll go into Adam and, and the start of his journey here in Namibia. So I actually grew up in the UK. I had a production business, which I started around 20 years old with my business partner, Peter Farrow. And uh, we ended up doing just motorsport content for a couple of years before we actually transitioned to Dubai and partnered with an Indian production house mm. where my other business partner called Rajiv Varani joined up with us. And uh, fast forward on uh, 10 years, we've got an amazing team of like 15. We do some amazing work. We're turning over probably, I think, nearly close to six, six million dirhams a year, which is about you know $2 million. Um, we have like 150 clients on regular retainers. And um, it's it's just it's an amazing place to be, amazing opportunity. But it didn't start that way. The first two three years were pretty painful yeah. in terms of trying to get clients. Like I landed in Dubai after doing like probably a hundred plus assets already. I knew how to shoot content, but I didn't know how to network. I didn't know how to sell. Mm. I remember my first year. I think I did six thousand dollars, and in my th- second year, I did like twenty four thousand dollars. And I'd lost like we almost closed and went home because obviously moving to any new country when you don't know a network was pretty painful. So I don't know if a lot of filmmakers resonate this, but I mean, there are so many talented guys in Dubai, probably here as well, that just probably don't know how to pitch themselves, know how to articulate their value. Mm. So, I mean, yeah, hoping to get into this today. But Adam, I'd love to hear a bit about your journey and where you started to so tell us how because you've been you've been running three years now. Is that yeah, right? that's correct. Yeah. So how did you how did you even get into this? Yeah, so basically what happened is I was very lucky to have started with two other people. So we started. I started the business with two partners. So it was always kind of my brainchild, you know, it was my baby. But I brought two people on that were also very keen and they were also in the industry. They were quite experienced. So we had someone doing finance and I had a second shooter, second creative. And I must say that that was actually one of the big things for me. Don't do it alone. Don't don't start your business alone. Find someone you can really trust and you have to really trust them, right? Because it's, it's your baby. Um, but don't do it alone and find someone you can trust, find someone you can count on and start it with them, right? So those two partners are now no longer with the business. They've gone their separate ways. So about two years into the business, um, happened pretty quickly, but they decided uh, to change career paths. One is in New Zealand now and one is in South Africa. Very happy for them. I wish them all the best with the career. You know, the other one, uh, one of them is still shooting and the other one has changed careers completely. I mean, just like I did. Um, so now... I'm working with a second part, new partner in the business. Uh, we work very closely together, and we have four editors on our team that are uh, remote. So COVID also taught us regarding remote work that you don't need to have a premises to run a business. If you don't need it, if I need a studio, I can hire a studio. If I need a boardroom, I can hire a boardroom, right? Per shoot, client, client covers the cost of that. Mm. I don't feel the need for a burgeoning premises and an expanded team uh, immediately after COVID when fast internet connections are available and we courier drives all over the country and there's no, I don't, I don't feel the need for that. Yeah. I think it's very important to recognize that, you know, just like when you're, you know, no matter what you do in life, Mm. you want to be able to be, you want to live within your means and live lean. I think, you know, there's no point having an ego here and trying to have an amazing business with lovely reception areas and like lovely meeting rooms. And if if it's, if it's not necessary, Mm, if the demand's there, it's different. To be honest, to be honest, instead of paying rent in this country, I'd rather hire three or four more editors. Exactly. Why not not have editors? Because cash is king. And one of the things, you know, a lot of filmmakers experience, Mm. and I'm sure you've experienced it, Mm. we have it in Dubai all the time, is that Mm. cash flow is also pretty, pretty tricky. Mm. One of the main Mm. reasons I think that is, is because, Content for me is not something that you can really easily scale in terms of a business because it's not repeatably booked 100%. by clients unless you are really able to assure the value is there That's correct. on a monthly basis. That's correct. And most filmmakers don't know how to articulate the value. No, they don't. So they don't. in terms of your own um, processes, what sort of steps and ways do you or what things do you do to ensure that your clients get the value? Like what do you what do you sell? How do you sell yourself? Yeah, so what we do is we, I mean, we've specialized quite a bit in short form content for social media. We, we do a lot of our work ends up on social media, although we do have scope to that. 
And one thing I sort of struggled in the first year is figuring out exactly that question, right? Like, what am I selling? It's like, are we just trying to sell a video to client so that client has the video, you know, the boss has the video, and then he looks at it and he's like, yay, nice video, and then nobody ever watches it. Then That's I'm not, what mostly what does happen. Then I'm not doing I've my job. I've done commercials that are like on YouTube with 100 views still. Then it's, not, it's been a waste of an investment. Not doing my job, right? And yeah. We're not doing our job then. Yeah. So what we do at the same time is we also offer... To some extent, you know, we, we make it quite clear that we're not we're not a social media house or we're not a marketing house. Mm. So we are a production house. Mm. Uh, but we do offer to some extent um, guidance on how to use the product. Yeah. Particularly if you have people in oh, a I marketing... I think every filmmaker should do that. Particularly if you, if, you, if you have people coming from a marketing department to you, very often they actually don't know how to leverage video, right? Mm. Where they come to you as the expert, but they're not just coming to you for the video and for the pretty shots and the cool angles. Mm. They're also coming to you for how do they use video. And they expect that from you. And if you can't provide it to them, to be honest, that's 50% of your value out the door. What are, you, what, are you, what are they paying you for? I mean, one of the things that always... And I still struggle with this, and it's a journey that I think you guys all need to ask this question to yourself. Mm. If you don't know how to really... If you don't level up and mm. try to invest more into your clients' businesses mm. when you're pitching to them... Mm. You're doing them a disservice and you're mm. doing your reputation a disservice. Mm. There's, I mean, there are going to be brands out there and customers and clients that like the idea of getting into the content game. Yeah. People that are maybe very new to it sure. don't are going to you for expert advice. Correct, correct. And you might be able to produce a fantastic asset mm. and it might be high quality and mm. there might be a lot of them. That's great. Which really are the two metrics only content creators can do if you're not publishing the content. Correct. Quality correct. and quantity. Correct. So if you don't invest in ensuring that that asset delivers the message or mm. conveys what the, the job is meant to do, because that's why it's it. The, the content's not about the quality. It's about the purpose of the asset. 100%. We make it as best as possible. Yeah. But if we're telling a rubbish story, or if the client's not media trained, or if they can't yeah. convey their value correctly, then the asset's worthless. I, yeah. So so how do you get... I mean, for me, I have this problem. Sometimes I have to turn down work. Do you do the yeah. same? Like, if you think... You know, I know I can do this job, but I don't think they're far along. I mean, do you have some sort of qualification process with your No, clients? absolutely. Look, to be honest, we used to, I mean, first year in the business, you take anything you can get, right? You're fishing for scraps at that point. Mm. You, you mm. just want something in the bank and something, you know, something to eat maybe that evening. And that was our struggle for about a year. Uh, then the second year was a lot of stabilizing and refining the business. And now third, third and a half year into the process, we get to the point where we can be quite selective about our clients because who we work with does affect our reputation as well, right? It does affect our brand. There are some clients we won't work with in terms of the brands they represent because we don't want to be associated with that, but that's quite rare. Now we're talking stuff like gambling houses maybe or businesses that we wouldn't want to be associated with us. So we've had a couple of those calls where it's like we're not sure if we want to work with them. But um, in terms of qualifications... I try my best to, from, from the get-go, is see what the client wants and see if the client needs, uh, see if the client knows what they need, right? So it's not so much of a, you don't know what you're doing, we're not working with you. It's more of a, mm, you might not know what you're doing, are you open to guidance? Yeah. Because lots of times clients don't know what they're doing. Somehow maybe they don't have, want to read the advice, they think they know what they want, but you've got to challenge it. To make yeah, sure yeah they, they, have, they have a very strong idea of what they want, but yeah. they don't actually know what they're doing. And these are the worst. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to say those are the worst clients to work with, is the ones that don't know what they want, but are very certain about what they don't want. Yeah. You know, they, they're absolutely sure what they don't want, and they'll stick to their guns on mm -hmm. it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so... I think the mission is to educate very much. The mission is to educate client, educate, and also educate yourself. Mm. Educate yourself as to what you are actually selling. Yeah. Because that's the trap, you know, we as on the artist side, we as artists on our artist side, it's like we want the pretty colors, we want the lens flares and yeah. the T1.4 and, uh, you know, all the nice shiny things. Um, but is the product good and is but it that's working features for we client? care about. The client doesn't mm. care about that. Mm. Correct. I, I did a workshop here um, in the studio a, few, a couple of days ago for Sony mm. and... Mm. I was trying to get across to the audience that it's not about quality anymore. Correct. Content, all really, there's so many good cameras out there. There's so many good Correct. lenses. Correct. And there's so many very talented people. And content and the cameras are now so good. Correct. Especially the Sony Cinema line. They're so easy to use now. Exactly. You can give, like I was using the, F, I, was, I gave the FX6 to a few students mm. and they were getting content with it that looked, that looked amazing. Yeah. So, so really, yeah. um, w where people are going to level up, I think, as a filmmaker is if they learn to develop their own business acumen because then Correct. they can educate their clients on business acumen. You Correct. can't you can't not practice what you preach, right? Yep. Content mm. is a digital asset. Yep. A digital asset has a purpose. Mm. If you don't understand the purpose of that digital asset and its benefits and how it's going to mm. be maximized, then 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 it's a waste of investment. But how do you understand mm. the benefits of digital assets if you can't even market yourself correctly? Correct. So the irony is is that we're designed to create assets to help market and increase sales or save time. Yep. Those are the three metrics usually yep. B2B. Yep. 
Save money, save time, earn money. Correct. So if we can't do that to ourselves, then we're in no position to really educate our clients. So it's difficult because we've got to take a step back and say to clients and challenge their investment in a nice way and give them guidance, of like you say. Of course. But we also can't not practice what we preach and apply that to ourselves. So before any filmmaker I feel can level up, they have to earn a certain, you know, basic foundation of business acumen. Yeah. Yeah. understand how digital assets and sales and marketing works mm. and only then can you grow now you don't need to grow into an agency mm. but you need to be able to put your hat on to know when an agency is needed now there's three Correct. types of clients i think there's there's obviously well there is three types of clients there's b2c mm. so like if you were doing a film for a bride mm -hmm. okay so no need for saving money time or mm. or mm -hmm. making money yeah exactly. she just wants a beautiful memory asset yeah, which exactly. is fine you've got b2b which is like you know you're you're selling to a restaurant and you want to help convert to mm. get like get sales or something, or maybe save time, train staff. Yeah. And you got B. To, I like it, I like to call it B to A, business to agency. Mm. Well, you don't need to worry about the B to B metrics yeah. because the agency will handle that. Correct. But what they would care about is the reliability, the consistency, the quality. Yeah. So that's where 100%. I think most filmmakers flourish. And for me, a good, I'd say thirty five percent, forty percent of my revenue in Dubai does come from agencies. Is it the same for you? Yeah. Uh, I'd say a little less here. I'd say maybe about 25%, 20%. Is it because there's no agencies? So it's a little less. Um, I think agencies and video work, I even I think agencies locally still struggle with uh, implementing video work. I think what happens is often agencies in the traditional sense, um, this is my problem with the middleman model, is that agencies then add their markup on things, right? And they, they start it does struggling. Make, make the client very expensive for Correct. basically it, the same product. Yeah. It makes it very expensive for the same product and then client will take it once and it won't have the same impact because often agency also just doesn't necessarily care. Hmm. Um, they just want to deliver, right? They want to invoice. And that is a problem I see where agencies sort of lack care because you have business people, they're not people who are passionate about marketing. Mm. You know, there's a big difference. There's mm. a big difference between someone who's passionate about marketing and someone who's passionate about their bottom line. Mm. You know, there's, there's, there's quite a contrast there. So that's a problem I see here, um, particularly in Namibia with, with agencies locally. Um, it's not about good work anymore. It's about invoicing, right? It's about it's numbers. Volume. Yeah, correct. It's volume. It's, 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 a, it's a content farm or, a cr you know, it's a crunch farm, basically. Yeah. Um, so agency makes about 20%. I'd say 80% is direct to client with okay. us. Interesting. Good. Yeah. So if so, for the viewers, let's assume that there's someone here watching that is yeah. maybe a solo freelancer, maybe worked a couple of years, or maybe they've just started. Mm, mm. If you were to guide them on how to start a video production business or a production house, where would you start? How I would start is immediately move away from yourself. Don't make it about yourself. Don't call it Adam Productions. It's the worst mistake you can do. Don't, that's not. That's not. I thought you were called Adam Productions. No, Storyworks. I'm joking. I have a name. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have a personality. No, no you're I, the KPI of Storyworks. That's the difference. So it's good to be part of a personality. I agree with you. Correct. Yeah, within the business. Within the business. So it's good like to be. Like Richard it, Branson, Virgin, Elon good, Musk, Tesla. Correct. It's good to be a personality. Elon Musk, Tesla, exactly. So whoever you are, you know, it's great to be a personality. It's great to be a person that clients trust and clients can come to, at least for a start, right? For the first three years, you want to make sure you, that you are someone that clients can approach and clients can come to and clients trust you. You know, you can have an editor or a finance guy or whatever you want. But make sure that if it's your business, you're kind of the face of it at first. Um, start a brand. Remember, there's a difference between brand and freelancing. That's what I would do. And make sure you're easily accessible. So many people here start, you know, small production company. They've bought a camera. They've invested. The investment's there. They have the gear. You know, the gear sits there on the shelf. But they're uh, a secret. And if I want to call them, mm. I can't find a number. Yeah. I just cannot find a number. There is no contact number. There's no Facebook page. Yeah, I, no I totally agree. Like the customer journey needs to be frictionless. And that's yeah. basics. That's basics. Yeah. Have 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 social media everywhere. You must be all over socials. Every single post. Okay, maybe not every single post, but your posts must have conf contact information attached. Your yeah. socials must be updated. Everything yeah. must be. If I send a mail to you and I want to work with you and it bounces back, I will never talk to you again. Mm. It's not going to happen. And neither will your clients. Very true. No, I think it's important. I mean, this. I also explain explain this in the workshop. Like, we have to understand as filmmakers, when you become a brand, it's not the video and the edit that's the product. Mm, it's correct. everything that you do up to the point Whole of journey. shooting, which is the product. So it's the how you handle the client, how you respond, how your emails 100%. look, how your website looks, how the 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 pre production brief goes, how the mm -hmm. call sheets, production mm -hmm. schedules, storyboards. Mm -hmm how you orchestrate and make the client feel like they're being looked after before the shot is even done. Correct. The alignment to ensure that what we're shooting is in line with the post-production, getting the scope correct. And then after the edit, you know, delivering more, over, like yeah. ensuring the, the, the process is important. Because a lot of us get, and in, in the early days, even I experienced this, you, you, you get caught up sometimes in 
ongoing feedback loops mm. and mm. you then start to resent the client the client then finds it like there's friction mm. and, and mm. most most clients will actually and I, I don't know the stat on this but i bet you it is i bet this stat is correct mm. i would bet more than 50 percent of when clients don't want to go back and work with filmmakers it's usually because of a problem in post yeah, that's pro yeah, yeah. which actually yeah. actually is a problem in pre-production yeah. because you've correct. not planned or correct. they've not You've right. not asked the correct questions. So you, I think taking ownership is a big one. If you yeah. don't take ownership to ensure that you get the correct intel from mm. the client and manage their expectations before you walk into the project, mm. it's on 100%. you. So a lot of people blame clients for feedback loops and you know abusing their time. But if you're if you're clear and transparent and communicative at the beginning, I mean you can you tell save that. You can tell five minutes into a call if a client's going to waste your time or not, right? And you can make the call right then, right before you even send sure. them the quote, right? That's that's when you should yeah. be making those decisions. I mean, you do get your not, odd rare one. Don't get me wrong, but sure. I mean for the majority of cases, I mean yeah. you get the outliers, but but it, you can generally you can tell, you know, especially with a bit of experience, you can tell what the client's going to be like. So mm. if you agree to something before you even press record in the camera, before you send the quote. And they don't stick to it. That's where your contracts come in place. Have contracts. Have contracts for everything. Mm. Absolutely everything. Sign it off. Agree on it. So, Tim, give me the top three things that you would do to guarantee growth in a new business. So, um, I've actually got a pretty um, comprehensive methodology here that I actually mm. um, teach my students. It's called ECV. Okay. So, the first part to growing is, and I think you would agree with this, is you have to put effort and time and energy into becoming extraordinary. Mm. And what I mean by that is, obviously growth is going to be very, very hindered if you can't shoot correctly mm. or if you can't deliver a good product. We have to assume here that you guys watching mm. know what you're doing regarding content. Yeah, the basics, yeah. And, and once you've got that, then you can start focusing on everything else. But extraordinary doesn't just mean good, good shoot, good edit. Mm. It means, like I said, very nicely branded documents, a very yeah. cohesive process, good yeah. systems. The whole pipeline. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you be, need to be the best in the game, but you do need to be the most consistent. Mm. So extraordinary means consistency, in my opinion. Correct. Like McDonald's is not the best burger on the planet, but it makes the most money as a burger chain because yeah, of correct. what? It's, tastes, it's systems. Tastes the same everywhere. Tastes right? the same, consistency. Mm. Like you go to Japan, go to mm. America, the Big Mac is the same. Mm. So if you can create consistency in your product, then there's scalability. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is credibility. ECV. Credibility is super, super important because you can be very, very extraordinary, but if you've not got anything credible to prove that, mm. then you're not going to get people to take a chance on you. Mm. And most businesses, I think when you're speaking to clients and stuff, you have to understand a lot of them are maybe doing it for the first time. Maybe they've been burned in the past. Mm. And, and mm. content, you know what it's like. It can be done very, very badly. And it's very hard to systemize. Yeah. Jordan Peterson spoke about this the other week. He said that you cannot create systems for people that are creative people because then they can't be creative. Mm. So to create systems within a production agency or a creative house, it's actually very difficult. It means that you can only apply systems in certain elements, yep. but there are certainly some rogue parts of the business that have to remain unsystemizable Correct. for it to be, to be, to, you know, to flourish. So, but credibility will stem into how you do that is by investing a lot into a great portfolio, getting a lot of you know great testimonials, great case studies. Do what you can to give us get as much social proof as possible. Mm. And that's mm. the reason why I think the social media value is for filmmakers. Is like you might not get a load of business from social media, but certainly when you're shaking your hand, shaking the hand of the client across the table, or if you do networking and stuff, when they follow and check you out, they are going to see what you're like online. They are going to see your digital footprint. Mm. And if the social proof is not there. It's going to raise alarm bells. Correct. Yeah. And the last thing is visibility. So extraordinary, credibility, and visibility. Visibility is crucial for growth because yep. if you're yep. a secret and you're not putting the effort into direct outreach, 100%. Um, I mean, there's direct outreach. There's 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 obviously advertising. You can do content creation, affiliates and partnerships. And the last mm. thing is word mm. of mouth. If you don't put efforts into networking, getting referrals, and just getting yourself out there, yeah, correct. You're, you're never going to grow. If you do those three things correctly, and it's only these three things, I think, mm. you're guaranteed to grow. 100%. 100%. And, and you know, depending on the depending on how much effort you're willing to put into those things, that's that'll directly scale into your growth, right? Something like social media, for example, everyone thinks it's quite passive. You know, they make a Facebook page they post once in March 2018, and then social media doesn't work for me, you know? Mm. That is, social media is not actually a passive element. If you're running your own social media pages or you have someone doing it for you, social media, um, it's actually, it must be a very active element. It should be. Even you if must, it doesn't deliver pursue. ROI, it does. Because Correct. because even if people, you don't get direct DMs from it, like you, like if you. It's not about direct DMs. No, no, it's never about direct no, sales. No, it isn't. Yeah, exactly. it's, it's about, because you can't, it's very hard to measure this ROI. People say I don't get anything from it, but that's not true because you don't know how many of your prospects that you close have checked you out online. And presence. then that's nudged them over the end. Correct. 
Correct. You, you got you got to understand that it's social media is a bit like branding. If you have a very poorly branded entity, it's not going to reflect premium value. That's correct. You know, and and at the end of the day, like it's not about the product. If you look at Samsung and Apple. People queue up outside to get mm. an iPhone. People don't Correct. queue up to get a Samsung. Correct. But they're both phones. They both do the job. Yeah. You're not going to hind- you're not going to be hindered by not having an iPhone. Hundred percent. Really. But people buy it because of the brand and the positioning and how exactly. premium it is. Exactly. To do that to yourself, you're on for a one. I mean, you'd be shocked how many clients I, I, you know, it's brand new clients. I've never worked with them before. You know, they, a mail pops into my mailbox and they want to work with me. You know, we booked the project, and then they're like, "Yeah, I've been following you on socials for years." Yeah. And it's like. Right. Because okay. it's a warming up tool. Social Correct. media is a warming up tool. It's Correct. like a wingman. It just, you just need to ensure that you feed it. Feed your just... wingman. You got to feed your wingman. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So Adam, let's let's talk about measuring because mm-hmm. I think the saying what you measure grows, right? Mm. And one thing I don't think a lot of filmmakers do is they don't measure enough stuff. They don't mm. re- like behave like someone like statistically. Yeah. And and there's good and bad things that you can measure. So Give me something, one thing that you should measure that's good and one thing that you should measure that's bad. I think I'll give you one that's in the middle and then I'll go to the bad. Um, so the one in the middle I'd say is time. I'd actually say measure your time and not just time spent. You know, it's very easy to measure sort of hours spent in, I mean, if you're running an hourly rate, it's hours built to client versus hours spent on projects, right? You can measure that. But it's also about time throughout the business, time throughout your processes, uh, because we do have finite amount of time. And especially as a business, as a filmmaker who's starting off, you do have very limited amounts of time. And a day becomes very, very, very short when you start running the business. So measure time and see how you're spending your days. That's what I would say. That's the first thing that's actually, it, it can have a massive impact. That's a great once, thing. Once yeah. you start, once you start realizing how you're spending your days, and just write it down for a week. How are you spending your days? Because we don't me- we, we like we measure like what kit we hire and maybe mm. what the cost of a studio sure. is, but we don't measure how many hours have we put into this job. Correct. And when you do that, you can start working out what your profit per hour is or profit per day is. Because it's not remember, it's also not just about it's not just about profit per job, right? It's also about if we're talking now scalability. If you're at the point where you want to start scaling. You need to know how much time you have in a day for other stuff, for other projects. for Because scaling happens. Scaling doesn't happen by itself, right? You have to go there. If you want to hire someone, you have to hire them. If you want to if you want to interview them, you've got to interview them. You know, If you want to start training them, you've got to train them, or someone's got to train them, right? Um, so you need to know how much time you have in a day. Otherwise, you just burn yourself out. And, and you run out of time very quickly, and then you start panicking, and then you don't have enough time to do all your things. So you need to first get that grasp of what you're spending, what you're spending your days on. Yeah. So measure time. So now tell me something that you should measure that's probably seen as bad. So I'd say I'd say something bad that one can measure is lack of team performance, especially initially, because we all get excited at the beginning, right? We all we all want to hire, we want to have, you know, a couple of editors and we want to have a couple of shooters and we wanna that is how growth is, you know, that's how you guarantee growth basically. You need you need some you need someone other than yourself doing some of the work, right? You can't do it all yourself. Uh, but lack of performance, I would say even with a small team, even, even if you just have a couple other people besides yourself, and if you're paying them, and if they're being paid, that's cash flow, right? That's money coming out of your business to pay these people for work being done. Uh, so I would say measuring performance is very important, even from the get-go, even if you're only a three-man team. Like you How don't, do you measure that, though? You don't, so you can go, there's different scales to that. You can go... You can go sort of as hard or as soft as you want. You can have, so what do we like to do, what I like to do with my team is I like to have a bit softer deadlines for projects. So there's a deadline that's communicated to client and there's a deadline that's internal, right? This is based off experience, right? This is based off what we are charging for the job and what the rest of our workload looks like. So we give, we give client a specific amount of time that this job will be completed in, right? First draft for V1 for their feedback. So our deadline for that is we give them 10 working days. So that is generally what we do for most of our projects. Although we do have a clause in the contracts that state that things can be different depending on scope. So it, it this comes down to experience how, how much, you know, what, what kind of project it is. Um, but then the internal deadline is four days earlier than that, right? The internal. So, so manage the internal deadlines a little bit earlier than that. Um, communicate to external clients a little bit differently as well. But performance internally, it gives you a little bit of a lead time. Never communicate to your team, you know, that the deadline is on Thursday and then client the same Thursday, right? Always give the team a little bit more lead time so that in case there's issues, in case something comes up, you know, they should have it done by Tuesday and then you still will want to do feedback internally. You have two days of lead time just to tidy things up if you need to, right? Uh, Because if you communicate 10 o'clock on a Thursday morning and then a card fails or a drive crashes or a server resets or anything happens, you know, you never know what's going to happen. So you just want to try and manage that situation a little bit ahead of time. But... If your team is consistently not meeting performance deadlines, and if they're consistent, if they, 
But if your team is consistently not meeting their deadlines and consistently not hitting performance targets, however you choose to measure those, then that is something you need to start solving within the business because that can that can absolutely eat away at your not just your money but also your your health, mm. your, your your stress levels. Absolutely, it'll eat you. Tim, so how would you measure in your business one good thing and one bad thing that you can measure? So one good thing I think is money. Mm. And money comes from leads. Mm. And I don't think enough of us measure leads. Mm. So one of the best things I think anyone can do, just to go back to the growth just before I answer that, is to invest in self-improvement. Mm. You know, invest in yourself. Like education courses, books, read. Mm. And mm. there's this particular author called Daniel Priestley who runs this company called Dent in Australia. And he has a fantastic array of books, which I recommend any filmmaker read. Mm. Um, there's Entrepreneur Revolution, Oversubscribes, KPI, etc. Cool. Now, in one of the books, he talks about measuring this thing called your laps, which is your leads, appointments, presentations, and sales. Mm. What that means is that let's just say you go to a networking event and you meet a, you know, a, a wedding event caterer, DJ, whatever, just someone mm. that's in the mm -hmm. in the wedding business. That's a potential lead. There's a potential opportunity there. Then you need to then start measuring if they're cold, warm, won, or lost. And the process is, is laps. So mm. you want to try and first pitch the appointment. Never try and pitch the sale to someone you just meet. Yeah. Pitch the appointment. Yeah. Like when you go to a woman at a bar, you don't pitch marriage. Yeah. <laughs> you you yeah. pitch a few dates, you get to know each other. Exactly. You know, so pitch the appointment. And then if that appointment goes through, that's one to one. Mm. If the appointment goes well and there's synergies and they're interested in working with you, measure if you can if they're then interested to receive a presentation proposal or quote mm. so p and then that's that's one 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 and then based off that depending on how you deliver the presentation and you do that well and hopefully if they're in, it's in line with everything that you've asked and you've asked mm. enough questions and it's in their budget range the sale will happen so that's one 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 now you do this with a hundred you might have a hundred leads you might end up only meeting 60 you might only get 50 presentations out and then you only might get 10 sales Correct. so then you can measure your conversion from 100 into 10 sales i did 60 out of 100 Maybe you might have like a hundred leads and only twenty, uh, yeah. only twenty appointments. Now that's fine if it's cold calls because a twenty percent I will meet you after t of a hundred phone calls. That's good. Twenty percent on calls, good, yeah. Yeah, but if you like met someone at a networking event or you got referrals and you only put twenty out of hundred, then that's a problem. Yeah, it's a bit rough. So you've got to measure your laps in different categories. Like I'm going to measure my laps against cold calls. I'm going to mm. measure my laps against emails. I'm mm. going to measure my laps against events. And then you can start looking at how you're doing. So if you've got like sixty appointments and only, um, let's just say you've got. Yeah, uh, 60 appointments and only five presentations. Yeah. That means you did something really wrong in the appointment. 100%. Maybe you smell. Maybe you yeah. didn't sound educated enough. Yeah. Maybe you didn't articulate your value well enough. So then you've got a pitching problem. So by doing yeah. this, you're actually orchestrating how you move the needle on increasing your sales. 100%. So that's one good thing that I would do. Just to touch on that quickly, one interesting thing that nobody ever talks about is, you know, we're always talking about tactics and strategies and, you know, there's lots of buzzwords floating around as well. But what nobody really talks about is um, personality in terms of business. So you mm. need to be very honest with yourself. If you're running a business, you need to be very honest with yourself. Do I have the kind of personality that can sell? And there's two things that you can do in that case. Either you can train yourself if you feel you don't. You know, if you ask yourself hard questions and see if... But if you're you, going to be an entrepreneur, you need to train yourself. See if you have that. You, yeah, you can correct. maybe invent, like, implement a team, but if you are incredibly introverted, you'll mm. struggle, but then you're right, you will have to hire someone. Mm. No, absolutely hire someone. So see if you can do it yourself. If you don't feel you can do it yourself, start working with someone. You must start working yeah. with someone, at least till you get to the point. Because otherwise... Yeah, I think you're just going to be disappointed with yourself and it's not going to help your self-confidence. I mm. think... I think yeah. No, true. And the bad thing I would focus on when it comes to measuring something is I would reflect back to almost every project you've done. Mm. And if you can, speak to the client about that project and measure what the asset didn't achieve in what they were designing, mm. what they were hoping the asset to, mm. to fulfill. Mm. And that does two things. What it does is it enables you in the future to ask more questions to ensure the success of that asset. So mm. imagine you're not being paid. Imagine you're paying yourself for this asset to achieve mm. something. Forget the quality, forget the lovely lights and how you can make it artistic, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Forget all that. What is it designed to do? Yep. And that will differ between your B2B, B2A or B2C clients, yep. which we spoke about. Yep. Business client, uh, B2 customer, business to customer, business to agency. And if you can get the client to articulate clearly in the beginning as a new standard what it was designed to do, and then you can go back and even if it went bad, hold your hand up and say, I want to treat this as a great learning exercise and put the relationship either right mm or document the success, mm. then what you're doing is you're setting yourself up to win to either get future work 
improve your customer experience and your product overall. And then lastly, you only, you only get better as a filmmaker because then you realize that these digital assets are designing and geared towards executing something that the client wants to Correct. measure. And I think Correct. that is the most important thing that you should measure when it comes to the bad element of business because nine times out of 10 when we do a bad job, we want it out of our lives and we want the client out of our lives. Yep. But yep. you have to remember that everything is your fault as yep. a filmmaker. Yep. If you let the client into your life and you delivered something bad, you didn't engage or qualify them correctly. 100%. Obviously, there are slight differences, but there are all, there's always a way to avoid that. Mm. And I think mm. it's important that we relish in the opportunity to understand where we're going wrong all the time rather than when we're going right. It's, mm. it's, e it's of equal importance to know how we can always improve. Because if you don't improve, you don't grow. And if you don't grow, you die. Yeah, you're going to actually celebrate the wins and the losses, right? They're both, they're both tools. Incredibly important, yeah. Mm. So Adam, what are the two... I think one thing we... So one thing I think we should do right now is if, you had to, if I had to equip and you had to equip mm. the filmmaker now with two tools each, what were the two that you would pick? Mm. So probably first time would be shooting time. First time would be camera time, right? Uh, time spent practicing your craft. So don't don't underestimate that. You know, it's overwhelming starting a business, overwhelming getting into all the different things you have to do. There's a lot to figure out, right? Uh, don't neglect the craft end of the day. So, so important. keep at that, yeah. It's so true. Like there's so many cameramen out there that just don't like, grade their films correctly correct. or, they, or they don't shoot correctly. Yeah, so correct. yeah, it's like everything else falls apart if you haven't got the actual 100%. shoot and edit correctly. And then the second thing actually backs up that point almost exactly is data management. Like, don't forget about data management. Uh, everyone doesn't want to pay for a backup until they're literally begging for one to the uh, to the heavens. I guess you don't, it's like sky it's like skydiving shoots. You don't want to so this, this you is, don't want to skimp on that. This is the absolute <laughs> yeah. This is the, <laughs> this is the absolute basics, right? The absolute basics um, in terms of data management and lots of smaller studios don't actually have yeah. th any kind of a backup system. There's nothing. There's drives on the desk. You yeah. know, just one shoulder like this and the business collapses. Yeah. A lot of people, they outsource the offloading to like some assistant or intern. It's like, why are you doing the most important job of the whole 100%. day? Just like, just make sure that's done correctly. Put a good, good process in place. Yeah, I can't agree more. Exactly. And I heard a story once about a guy who was on a shoot uh, two weeks in the bush, right? Coming back and the final day of the shoot, he had an SD card, right? And he had a Pelican case. SD cards and Pelican cases. He was dropping it into the case. He was like putting it in the foam covers, you know, and as he drops it in, he closes the case behind it and he hears a crack, right? The card landed in between the gap on the case, snapped straight in half. Oh, no. Yeah. Grief. Rough stories. Well, what backups. Was backups. Yeah, yeah, go slow. When it comes to media, just take your time. Yeah, backup or pack up. Yeah. Goodness me. Two tools I'd recommend. Um, I would say, I, I mean, not to plug brand names, but I would say that it's important that you invest in some sort of group where software, you can mm. even use Google Sheets. Mm. But I think when you assign a task, whether you're handling a job or you're trying to figure out what stage it's at, get it down and get mm. it open so that your team can all see like a board What's of where we are. Yeah, because like I assign my tasks in two forms. There's an income generating task or there's just a generic business growth task or like mm -hmm. something or like an errand or something that needs to happen. And you want to just, just obviously separate the two, but it's important that when you have have an idea or you want to execute something, don't just ask them on the phone or send it in a WhatsApp or mm. lose it over an email because it's not anywhere that it's living. You're, you're then like giving excuses for your team to forget about it. And you probably won't forget. You probably won't remind yourself to remind the person that you asked mm. to do something mm. to do it. And that's how things don't get done. So I yeah. think if you can create some sort of software that it manages what you need to accomplish and, and that then helps manage your time and what you have to execute and then organizing those by high priority, is it urgent, you know, low priority, is it not yeah. urgent, that, that, that's going to be a super one. The second tool I would say is um, actually invest, like you guys are watching right now, you're investing your time into watching this podcast, mm. and hopefully you're finding it useful, invest and get tools that are geared towards helping you grow in self-development. Mm. So I would definitely buy filmmaking courses. Mm. I think they're incredibly affordable and undervalued these days, even for a few thousand dollars. I run one myself, but even if you don't, if you're not interested in what I'm doing, mm. like there are some amazing, like, like full-time filmmaker that Parker Wahlberg originally yeah, very created. Good. An amazing very course. Good, very good. A few hundred dollars, mm. you know, and the software discounts you get on that alone are, 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 are worth it. It's little things like this where just, just spend the money on, on learning from others and le don't just learn filmmaking, learn sales, learn business, learn mm. accounting, learn mm -hmm. branding, just, you don't know what you don't know, exactly. right? And and I think when you start going down this self improvement journey, you realize how much you have missed out in terms yep. of opportunities by not leveraging what other people have accumulated over the years and in their life and applying it to your own. You know, so I think 
books, courses, get a mentor, get a coach, even if it's life coach, mm -hmm. like just like a yeah, like exactly. Lewis Hamilton, the fastest exactly. F1 driver on the planet, he has a racing coach. Mm. Does he need a racing coach? Mm. I mean, arguably, he's the racer's fastest man on the planet, but yeah. but he does because 100%. you need that accountability, you need that guidance, you need that third person perspective. And I think also when you start diving into that self improvement game, once once you start feeling uncomfortable, once you start feeling uncomfortable with how much you don't know, that's actually when you're in the right spot. Yeah, that's when you're. That's when that's, the magic happens. That's when you know. Yeah. Okay, so Adam, tell me, <laughs> I think it's important that we celebrate the bad shoots as much as the good shoots, right? Mm -hmm. Tell me one of your worst shoots. What went wrong and what did you learn from it? Right, so, <laughs> oh my God. So me and the team still talk about this to this day. So we just opened the business, right? We'd, we'd, it was actually one of our first jobs. So we had a shoot for a local restaurant. We did that. And then the same week we opened, the same week we opened for business, we opened August 15th, right? And then I think on the 18th, we got booked for a shoot under a local director, right? I'm keeping names very far out of this conversation. <laughs> but you know who you are. No, we got, aliases. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so the gentleman... <laughs> no, so we got, booked, we got booked for a shoot with a local director. It was, I think it was our second or third job maybe that we've ever had, you know, operating, trading as a business. And yeah, we're in new business, but the team's not inexperienced. You know, we know what we're doing. We brought our own gear. He asked if we have gear. You know, when the director asks you if you have gear and that, then you generally should have a little more control of the set, right? So he asked if we have gear, and we had a little bit of gear, a little bit of lighting. We had two Sony cameras, and it's just corporate interviews, right? Corporate interviews are bread and butter for us. You know, it's, it's what we do every single day, basically. So it's simple corporate interviews for, you know, the birthday of a company or something. And what happened eventually is... Because the man was a film director, because he'd done some directing on film in the past, he took it on himself to shadow me the entire project. We shot for a full day at this corporate, right? For a full day because the script kept changing on the day. You know, the, t the script is being changed on the board. Right. He stands behind me, two hands on my shoulder. I'm holding the camera, you know. Two hands on my shoulder, the whole project. And every single shot, the man is shifting me. The man is shifting me and he's <laughs> looking at my screen. And he's telling me I'll where leave. to move. And, leave. and how to move. I was so close to leaving, but 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 I... I so he was like rocking you like a baby. I like, had just opened the business oh and God, God, I need money, right? So he's he's holding me right here. And You're it, a big chap, mate. You're not like a little guy. Yeah, so and he was shorter than me. You were shorter than me. So I, so feel, like I feel his breath over my shoulder there. Oh my his breath's coming in and I feel his hands up here. And then eventually they didn't like what they shot. So they animated it. And they did the whole happy birthday to the company in animation. The video never came out. We got paid. It's all right. But that's that. That was maybe, one of, maybe he fancied you a little bit. That was one of those times. No, he didn't. He no, didn't. we didn't. We've never spoken again. Oh God, never mind. That sounds pretty bad. That was rough. I'm not gonna lie. That was rough, and it took it took kind of, you know, it took all the all the sort of uh, humility I could muster to kind of survive that project because I know I need to get paid. You know, it's the first week we're open. I need to make something happen, uh, and yeah, yeah. You don't want to. You don't want to. Yeah. No, that's no words. No words. That's pretty funny. That was rough. You've got to take it, I think, a little bit. When you're in the early days, you've got to have these stories. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. You absolutely have to. You have to go through it. 100%. That was rough. I think my worst... Um, it's not my worst shoot, because it's far too long. I mean, this is, I need a whole podcast to explain it. Mm. But one, one particularly bad shoot that was quite funny that shows like sometimes how you can get naive and lack prep is we had a shoot where we were filming this... Uh, the progress of one of the largest zip lines being made ever in the world mm. in this mountainous area called Jebel Jace okay. in the United Arab Emirates. And um, I had a, an assistant at the time who who was driving because it's a three and a half hour drive there or like a four, no, it's like a four hour drive almost there because it's like at least two hours to get to the top when you get to the mountain. And it's in a very different Emirate, like a different state. Mm, mm. Um, and my uh, assistant who was driving, um, Picked, uh, picked me up and uh, didn't check the fuel and I wasn't driving so I wasn't there and we, when we got to like close to the bottom of the mountain because we were like on on the clock we had a whole day to shoot and like it was a 9 8 a.m call time so we yeah. left at like five in the morning and I don't know why he didn't like think I should get fuel on the way or arrive in a car with a fuel tank which is so basic <laughs> yeah he's we've got to the bottom of the mountain he's like oh we're um, a bit low on fuel and I was like <laughs> You're kidding, how low? And he was like, well, pretty low. I mean, you know, it's, the lights just come on. <laughs> I was like, dude, we got a 90-minute drive to the top of the mountain uphill. I mean, your fuel is not going to be... You're going to be running quite rich uh, yeah. fuel ratios there. That's going to yeah. be mean when we get to the top. It's going to... Mm. 
you know, what do we do? And he goes, well, we could turn around. I said, no, we're going to miss a shoot. I said, look, I said, um, let's just, hopefully we make just it to the top. It, yeah, well. If the shoot's done, the shoot's done. I don't mind waiting at the top because yeah, I don't want to yeah. let the client wait. You yeah, know, exactly. so if you, if you, you muck up, you don't make, you don't cause the client's time to be. Yeah, suffered exactly. Your exactly. So I said, we'll just have to end up waiting till we get to the top. Oh hopefully goodness. a delivery guy will come. Anyway, we, we are like nursing this car at the top of the mountain. We mm -hmm. get there just before call time. So it's okay. We do the shoot. Oh, wow. It's all good. We're like doing a bit of drone because obviously yeah. we're showing the, the, the happenings of the, the project being done. It was a massive project. This, it was like four or five months. It was for mm. Russell Kemmer tourism. And, um, we have all this like content of this being built and it's very successful, no issues. Mm. Um, and then obviously we get in the car and obviously, you know, within, you know, within a couple of minutes, the car is out, yeah, you know, of course. and, and you can't really coast the car down this, this hill because it's dangerous. The brakes yeah. don't really work. If the engine's yeah, yeah. not on, you're not leveraging the brake servo. So exactly. we're like, um, a bit stuck and at this point i've built quite enough rapport with the client to kind of let him know what's happened and so i've said to him look mate just to be very transparent with you and we have a bit of an issue we underestimated the the distance in our fuel tank and we have run out of fuel like to the point where like it's not even low he's like yeah. oh okay and he laughed but it was like well obviously i'm not gonna leave you guys here stranded because we are this thing has no restaurants there's no yeah. like we've got no water like yeah. Yeah. and again not prepared right always be over prepared so he said look well there's um the, the, you can call a delivery truck and we tried. And the reason why I had to bring the client into the conversation is I called a delivery truck and they said they'd be about five or six hours mm. away because it's mm. they're all busy and yeah, it's, it's a three-hour journey. Yeah. And a truck to get to the top of the mountain would take three hours. Mm. So I was like, oh my God, what are we going to do? Um, so the, luckily the client said, well, look, we've got... Um, uh, there's a couple of guys that w are working with me because it, was, it wasn't launched yet. There was only like mm. three guys on the mountain. He said, one of my guys, I think, has got a key to... Uh, to a to a hutch that's or like a little shed or something that's on the mountain mm, that does mm. have a few jerry cans in there'd be enough to get you to a petrol station because the nearest one was still like two hours away but it was downhill we could probably get there if we just put at least like a few liters in um so we called him and he's like um you know i think his name was chris or something hey chris uh we need to borrow the key to get into the shed because yeah. you know we need to borrow we need to get some fuel some guys with us he's run out of fuel He's like, oh, um, yeah, I'm doing uh, rock samples halfway up the mountain. I, uh, <laughs> I've, it's taken me four and a half hours to, to trek here. <laughs> I've got the key in my pocket. <laughs> so we're like, oh, no, what do we do? Um, and uh, I have a miraculous idea okay. where I take the uh, Phantom 4 drone that we have, launch it, and I... I get him to try and tell us where he is in the mountain. Okay. And we fly it to his location. Take the key. Take the key. We have a bit, a bit of string hanging from oh the bottom of the drone. Oh, my goodness. And I'm panicking because I cannot land this drone and then take off some. Even exactly. If you have anyone's used a drone, you yeah, can yeah. take off from three kilometers away, two no. kilometers. But no. luckily, we've got such good line of sight that I can see him. Like, I finally find him. He's wearing a red jacket. Yeah. Finally spot him. And he waves me down. And uh, he attaches the key to the bottom of the drone. Just and the drone nearly tanks it like, and the wind oh is like goodness. this. And it's back in the day where like the drones they weren't very good at staying still. Yeah, yeah, wind exactly. it was like all exactly. over the shop. I swear we almost lost our drone like two or three times. And yeah. we uh, fly the drone back to us. Uh, the keys dangling, and key. we get into the shed, and then we get home. So we oh save ourselves like six hours. So oh, what a mission! That was a it was it was not a bad shoot to be honest. I mean, I've had much worse, but that was yeah. a pretty funny example of how like you know it was a good story. Yeah, the yeah. client the client enjoyed it, but I think you know never never be. Never underestimate how prepared you can be for a shoot. Make sure you've got a full tank of fuel. Make sure you've got enough water. Make sure you've got food. And, and yeah. I think filmmaking, yeah. you realize that you're actually just problem solving all the time. Correct. If this doesn't work, if this cable breaks, Correct. like you're risk Correct. mitigating all the time. Correct. And it's 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 that you know it's just figuring out things on the go, right? You you got to do that. You got to be prepped for it. Exactly. Well. So where do you see the industry ten years from now? Well, I mean, there's different levels of different industries, right? So one thing. Like, if you look at the Sony Burano, the new camera that's just been launched, mm. I mean, that's now changing the way cinema's been shot. Mm. Like, you're now, leveraging, you're now leveraging the auto functions in the early Cineline cameras and seeing it now on the top flagship models, mm. which is, like, it's really a big eye-opening move yeah. for the industry, and it's yeah. making probably a lot of the very other big cinema camera brands going, ah, sure. okay, we've got a lot less features in this, yeah. and it's not expensive either. So I think that's what we're going to see is we're going to see crews shrink. You know, I mean, a good example is look at the creator film. The FX3 was used in 100%. that. And that's like a, it's a, a camera you can buy over the counter for like $5,000 and it mm. would use to produce a feature. So one thing I'm noticing in the next 10 years is that, again, people are not going to be judging things on quality anymore. We're going back to the roots of exactly. like, is the film a good yeah, story? Exactly. Is the lighting good? Is the, is the directing good? Is, and I think that's important. You know, you can't get away with just a good glossy film now. You need, it needs to have depth. Mm. So I think the top end of the industry 
we're actually going to probably get better narrative or or the or that it's going to be we're going to go back to focusing on what's important mm. i think when the in the lower end of the industry i think what you're doing is you are going to have a massive wave of content creators because now it's very easy for someone to pick up a camera and get a good shot because obviously all these auto functions mm. so mm. that means that there's going to be more people producing which means it's going to become a noisier market mm. but even though it's a noisier mm. market it mm. means that other brands have to get on board and develop content. That's correct. So yeah. I think we're going to end up seeing, con you know, people dipping into, you know, pay partnerships. They're going to be investing in long form content. You're going to be exploring with more formats. I think mm. content creation is actually going to be one of the most future proof roles. I think in the next ten years because it's going to work in conjunction with AI. I mm. mean, we're working from a pixel democracy now. Everyone correct. is on their phone. That's correct. where the attention is, and money circulates where there's attention. Yeah. So I don't think anyone in this world who has a phone gets by by not checking out social media. Mm, 100%. You know, and social media is not, you know, it's not like people dancing in front of the phone on TikTok. It's it's a way for you to receive information just like anything else. Mm. TV's under threat, sure. even cinema's under threat. For sure. But OTT and social media platforms is the future. So I think in 10 years, I think we're going to be, I think now if you, if you still have not made the jump to go entrepreneurial with us or join an agency or join a production mm. house, mm. Now's the time yeah. to get on board. Great time to do it now, yeah. And all the tools are ready. Like if you think 10, 15 years ago, you know, some people started back then and, you know, mm. it was a struggle and people tried their it's best. Very hard, yeah. But the gear was a lot worse for what you could get. Now the tools are, everything's ready. Everything's ready. I mean, if you wanted to get a, like a steady cam shot mm. or like a, a steady gimbal shot mm. 12 years ago, you'd have mm. to hire a steady cam operator. 20, 20 it, years it, ago, if you wanted to get aerial view, you have to hire a helicopter. It, yeah, now you can give a toddler an Osmo and it gets a shot. Yeah, correct. So if you had. So to sum up, if you had to give filmmakers one thing to be disciplined in, to stop them, or to enable them to, I guess, endure the pains of being an entrepreneur and a filmmaker, what is it? I'd say prioritize your health, to be honest. I'd say prioritize physical and mental health because it's very easy to sort of let that go when things get busy and then you get overwhelmed and then you end up not sleeping well. Just, just even the basics, like just something like sleep. Prioritize sleep. Because if you don't sleep well, how are you supposed to work well? Mm, and life becomes very overwhelming and running a business becomes very overwhelming very quickly. And if you're not getting proper rest and eating properly and just taking care of yourself in general, taking care of your headspace, where it's at, yeah. how do you sort of expect to function well? Number one, I completely mm. agree. So Tim, what would you what would you what would you want to share with the audience as one discipline to make sure you don't grow weary of the job? Because it gets tough, you know. I think it's a problem. People pin this on Gen Zs or new generations, and I hate that. Mm. I think it's a everyone problem. I think every generation is like this. But I don't think... I think people are impatient now. Mm. And I think you have to understand that everyone grows at different lengths. Some people are have more advantages than others. Mm. But in the end of the day, if you stick with something, usually if you are measuring it and you're doing the things like we spoke about in this podcast you will prevail. So I think trust the process and believe in the compound effect. Mm. Now, the comp I, I think that's one discipline. Believe and practice to compound interests in, in anything that you do. Mm. And that, in, that, like, let me use it in a terminology that we understand. If you want to get fit, we all know what we need to do. We need to eat healthy, mm. not eat a lot. Eat a lot of the right food only if we do. Mm, 100%. Be in a calorie deficit if we want to lose weight or just make sure that we don't consume more calories than we burn exercise and mm. do weights and just live a healthy lifestyle. It's not 100%. complicated. But, and if you want to achieve the results, you can do all of that for two weeks, but you won't see anything. Mm. A, a six pack's not earned in a weekend. Mm. It's earned by not amazing sessions, but just by turning up to the gym. Consistency. Consistency. Yeah. Mm. And just remember that if you show up and you put energy into your leads and your accounting and you put time into your craft, it may seem a mountain away. It might seem mm. such a huge distance away from where mm. you want to be. And that desire to grow is important, but you can you can get there quickly. And mm. there, there might, you might be able to find shortcuts and you might have, you know, the odd help. And obviously, you know, if you, if you work with a team, it's quicker, but you still, there's always going to be a compound effect mm. with anything. You're going to have this long, grueling process before you start reaping the rewards. Even me, it's taken me years to feel like I'm in a position where I can actually offer advice about the filmmaking industry. And I've been doing this for 12 years. Mm. For mm. years, I've just been suffering almost in silence in my production entity. And I would have done things much quicker if I just, you know, 
streamlined, you know, education, invested in this, invested in this, and this is why we're sharing these tips. But one thing that I did do correctly is I believed in the compound effect, knowing that if I stuck with, stuck with it a long time, it would come out. People mm. want quick fixes this day and age. You think they see like a content creator online yeah. that's made millions yeah. of millions, it's got millions of followers. 100%. And, and yes, you will get maybe the odd exception of someone that, you know, yeah, they just clicked, that, that right? clicks overnight. But yeah. You haven't seen, like Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast is mm. the most famous YouTuber. But for years, he was uploading videos mm. and they wasn't getting any views. Exactly. So so people don't see the grind. They see only what you do. Yeah, correct. And 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 it's like, and this is what we have to understand with social media and other things is that we, we get a warped and like perspective of what people are doing. And we always see the glossy bits, but we don't, like you say, talk about the mental mm. health and talk about the grind. So I just think trust the process. Make sure you can endure the process, which mm. is why your point's really good about health. I think if you prioritize your health and you prioritize your ability to endure something that can require a compound effect, I think if mm. these are the two disciplines guys to take away, don't ever, ever sacrifice your own inner self, mm. but do it so that you can endure. And if you endure, you'll make it. 100%. So guys, thank you so much for tuning in to the Sony Alpha Universe podcast. Um, I had a great time. Adam, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure. And it's uh, it's been great to share a lot of the pains and wins the wins and losses yeah over our production careers um obviously these are going to be a format there's going to be many more and um we hope you got a lot of value and if you want to learn anything else in the future feel free to drop a comment below or let us know what it is that you'd like for us to talk about and we'll obviously arrange that for you best of luck sonny